That is Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 16. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Amen. Thank you, Carrie. I've just got to point out, the singing has been incredible this morning, hasn't it? I really, uh, something I appreciate about Tom, Tom usually starts sending in his song selections two or three weeks ahead of the, the Sundays that he's going to be leading. And, you know, when we have people who are putting effort into our worship, anticipating our worship, getting ready to meet God as we come together, uh, doesn't that just have the effect of helping to lift all of us up a little bit? I know it's good for my soul, so really appreciate everyone who helps in our worship ministry, all of our song leaders. Uh, a, couple, a couple of guest speakers we have over the next two weeks. Uh, next week, I'm going to be leading a retreat for the uh, Fountain Group that we have. We have a group that meets on Wednesday nights dedicated to uh, contemplative prayer and uh, spirituality, but we've got a retreat coming up this next weekend, so really excited that Mike Glaspie is going to be preaching for us next Sunday. And uh, the Sunday following that, I have a close friend who's going to be in town. He's going to speak for our Teacher's Appreciation Banquet on that Saturday. His name is Russ King, uh, but Russ has been a friend and mentor of mine since I was uh, in middle school, high school, and uh, he has all the awkward teenage stories about me that he's able to share if he chooses to. I hope he'll go a little gentle on me, but uh, Russ is one of the most positive people that I've ever known. Uh, I know you don't know him yet, but I guarantee he's going to be one of your instant favorites. So I'm uh, really looking forward to a couple of good Sundays these next two weeks. I just hope at the end of it, y'all still want me back. So, <laughs> But uh, looking forward to s some extra people speaking for us the next couple of weeks. So uh, there's a story about a family uh, who invited another family over for lunch, and they wanted to kind of show off as we do. They wanted to show off the way that their son had been learning to say the prayer over lunch. And so they started talking to little Timmy and said, Timmy, do you want to say the blessing? Mm-mm. Timmy, come on, you know that you can do this. Why don't you say the blessing? You know, Timmy didn't want to say the blessing. And so they kept encouraging him, and they just wouldn't let it go. And they said, well, look, Timmy, don't you remember this morning? You know, Daddy said the blessing this morning. Why don't, right now, why don't you just say the thing that Daddy said this morning at breakfast? And he said, uh, okay. And so they bowed their heads, and he said, oh, God, why do we have to have these awful people over for lunch today? <laughs> It's pretty, it's pretty precarious, isn't it, to get someone else to be your spokesperson? Do you ever feel that way? I mean, I, I really dislike it when I hear someone, you know, any, any group that I'm loosely affiliated with, whether they're just talking about my, my race or skin color or churches of Christ or preachers in general or whatever it is, I hate it when people say, well, this is what those people think. And I want to say, hey, you know, I, I get a voice in that. Let me, let me speak for myself. But at the same time, it's really hard to think about the role that we have as God's spokespeople. Uh, Paul would use the word ambassador there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we're God's ambassadors. And so just even though in the image in this room, I would probably look like the guy who's red, really that's all of us. All of us are God's spoke people, all, all spokespersons. All of us are God's ambassadors whom he has appointed to speak on his behalf and to represent him to the world. That's a pretty daunting thing to think about. And anyone that you find in Scripture who's been given that role, if you have the space in Scripture to describe their life, they all go through the very same anxieties that we would go through. I would point to Moses as one example. In Exodus chapter 6, God approaches Moses 
about being his spokesperson to Pharaoh. Now, you could, you could frame this conversation in different ways, and it would sound positive. I mean, how would you like to get to be the person to lead your whole nation out of slavery? How would you like to get to be the person through whom God does miraculous things? I mean, that, that sounds really fun, but having to speak on God's behalf to powerful people, I mean, if you really actually got the flesh and blood opportunity to do that, it's pretty intimidating. And so Moses, Moses pushes back all the same ways that we probably would, and he starts making excuse after excuse. Yeah, but I mean, I'm speaking on your behalf, and I know we're talking right now and all that, but like, how are they going to know that I'm actually your, your spokesperson? And so, of course, in that situation, God says, well, here, you're going to perform this sign and that sign, and, and so you're good. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but who are you? I mean, there's a lot of different gods out there. How do they know that we're speaking of, of the correct God and the true God? And God even shares his personal name with Moses. But over and over again, he just keeps working his way down a list of excuses. Well, I'm a nobody. They're not going to know who I am. They may not know who you are. And on top of that, I just don't speak very well. That's what we all say, isn't it? I'm not good at public speaking. I'm not good at talking. I I stutter. I fumble over my words. And I got to tell you, this is a thing I've always wondered about because Moses describes himself as being kind of slow of speech. So there is the possibility that Moses had some sort of a speech impediment, but you have to consider the book of Deuteronomy is one big Moses sermon, like tons and tons of long chapters. So whatever he thought his limitation was, by the time God was done with him, it seems to me he was quite capable of communicating if he were willing to open himself up to that possibility. But um, Moses makes all these excuses And finally just even says, God, won't you just send someone else? That's when God finally gets irritated. He's like, okay, you know, I've addressed all your questions. And Moses says, eh, I don't want to. And so God uh, gives him some extra encouraging. But in Exodus chapter 6, here in verse 2, I want you to notice a couple of things that it's very important to God that people know. It says, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, the Lord, he's using the word Yahweh or Jehovah there, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Skipping to verse 6, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. So if I could summarize all that in in a couple of points, it seems to me that God is greatly concerned, number one, that people know who he is. There's a lot of things that people can mistake as God. There's a lot of versions of God. Even sometimes when people start telling you who God is, once they start talking about what it is they think that God is, you come to realize, wow, when we're talking about God, we're actually... We're talking about two different people. You know, their, their vision of God and what I think Scripture portrays as God are not, are not the same thing. God is very interested in being known for who He is. That's why we have Scripture, isn't it? God actually wants us to know Him. He wants us to know about Him. But in addition to being known personally, God also wants us to know the kinds of things that He's doing. So as he speaks to Moses, he's telling him, here's what's about to happen. Here's how all this is going to end. And yeah, I know you're nervous and you're scared and you feel inadequate, but this is the end of that story. This is where this is progressing. They are going to be freed. I am going to give them a land. I'm going to do everything that I promised to their ancestors. And so God is concerned with everyone in the world knowing, number one, who he is, but then also, number two, what it is that he's been doing. He wants them to know what he's done on their behalf. Now, the hard part of that for us is that God fully intends to accomplish these things through us. That was how Israel was going to get freed from slavery. God was going to do it through Moses. And at the prospect of the Great Commission, how is the world going to be reached? How are people going to hear the gospel? How are people going to be transformed through the presence of Christ? Well, the way that God is going to do that is through us. That's how God chooses to operate. He's not going to just shout it directly. He's not going to overwhelm people to the point that they couldn't resist. He's not going to intervene in ways that constantly disrupt the flow of our lives. But he has given us this task of helping people to know who he is and what he's done. 
I wanted to share a, an image with you, and you may remember it. I shared this image with you the very first Sunday that I preached here, which was four years ago this month, if you can, can believe that. But four years ago this month, I started preaching here, and on my first Sunday, this is an image I showed you that when I think about what it means for us to be in Christian ministry, this is not just for me, but for all of us, what does it actually mean when we try to speak on God's behalf? So take just a minute and kind of look at that and let that soak in a little bit. You start to see some figures pop up. You see Jesus there encouraging. You see the fishermen and are reminded of the apostles. You see prophets. You see John the Baptist. You see Moses. You see the accompaniment of, of angels, cherubim or whatever those things are in the background. I like to look at that image and remind myself that when we're trying to speak on God's behalf, when we're trying to tell people who God is based on Scripture, based on what God has revealed about Himself, when we're doing that, we're in some really good company, aren't we? There are some great people over the centuries who have gone and tried to do the very same thing that we're doing. Most of the people that we admire most in history are people who picked up this same mantle and said, you know, it's not easy for me and I feel inadequate, but I know the way that God is going to reach people is going to be through the words that come out of my mouth, through the acts of kindness that come through my hands and my feet, through the embraces that I give through my hugs. You know, it's, it's going to be through us that people learn about God and are able to have this encounter with God. So again, I'm, I'm encouraged by the company that we're able to keep as we go about this task. That image for me does, does in my head the same thing that Hebrews 11 does when it talks about the cloud of witnesses. There's all these people who've come before us uh, who would certainly be cheering for us to be strong. And I think, you know, wow, we're in some really, really good company when we speak on behalf of the Lord. And they all suffered times of fear, serious self-doubt, often failures, but just the same. Those are all people that God has used just the way that God will use us. This concept was not lost on Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 7, familiar passage, Paul says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The power is God's power. It's not our power. But the image of, of jars of clay, when you think of a clay pot, I, I can't help but think of my puny attempts in art class to make something out of clay that you fire in a kiln and like, you know, you, you have in your head this idea that it's going to be beautiful. And I know there are people who can make beautiful ones. Mine always end up lopsided and ugly. And it's often kind of how we feel as a, as a jar of clay, isn't it? That I just, you know, I, I wish I were something magnificent that I could impress people, but I'm really not that impressive. I'm off balance so much of the time. I'm not put together that well. Clay jars can be leaky. You break them and they shatter. And we're just the same way. I mean, we're, we're fragile. I wish, could, I wish we could be perfect containers that would preserve the Word of God perfectly in every way, but we're kind of leaky, aren't we? We forget about certain things. We, we, we fall off in certain places. And we are fragile. We are breakable. You know, if you cut us, we bleed. We're, we're imperfect vessels in every way. We're fragile and we're flawed, but, but just the same we have to say the same things that Moses did. God, if I'm going to teach people as your ambassador, I'm going to need some help. How are they going to know that you really sent me? Because anyone can be around us and say, well, they're not perfect. They don't have it all together. They don't have all wisdom and all answers to every question. So God, we understand that you want us to be your ambassadors, but you gave Moses signs, right? I mean, you sent plagues on people who didn't listen to Moses. People can feel quite free to ignore me. So how is it, God, that you're going to confirm that we're really your messengers? John chapter 13, another familiar passage. In verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So what is the proof that we offer? What is the sign that we offer that we really are God's children and that we are speaking authentically on God's behalf? The sign is our love. I want to share a statement with you. I'm going to read it a couple of times, because, and I don't remember where I first came across this one, but this has, for me, been very profound. It says, our love is the currency with which God buys credibility in the eyes of the world. 
Let that sink in. Our love is the currency with which God buys credibility in the eyes of the world. There's that kind of cliched statement that's actually, actually true that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Have you been told that before? People want to look in your life, and if they don't see that you're a person who really loves them and loves others and is any different than what they experience in the world, they're never going to believe anything you have to say about God. The way that the Word of God has credibility in the eyes of the world is that our love is that currency which purchases credibility. It's not just our love. It's God's love. It's God's heart working through our hands. People need to see in us the love of God. And once someone has experienced the love of God, they'll tell you that there's, there's nothing else like it. Um, I'm, I'm remembering a story I may have shared with you before, but when my parents were in college at uh, Lipscomb University, they've always told me this story about uh, there was this one a Muslim student who started attending Lipscomb University, and you know, it was the only Muslim there. And so as you can imagine, this is like in the 1970s, you know, every Bible professor had to really show what he was made of and try and convert this student. So several of the professors wanted to have meetings with them and tried to lay out the case for why they didn't believe in the Quran and why they thought Islam was, was problematic and why Jesus is a better answer. And they tried to argue and argue and argue. And of course, this kid was not budging, staying strong and committed to their faith. But then eventually, the student was baptized and became a Christian. And so, of course, the professors wanted to have a follow-up meeting and say, what was it that worked? What was the argument? What was the reasoning that they gave that convinced you to become a Christian? And he said, well, it wasn't, it wasn't an argument. What happened was I was surrounded by all these other Christian people, and they just loved me so much. And their love was so genuine. They were so accepting. And in my life, I saw the way that they built this bridge from, from their heart to my heart. And for me to become a Christian, all I really had to do was walk across. It was the love that convinced me. It wasn't your arguments. It wasn't your arguments. It was your love that changed me, that showed me there's something really true and deep about this. Our love is the currency with which God buys credibility in the eyes of the world. The love of God is this magnificent thing. The more you think about it, the more ways you can find to think about it. The love of God is much like the loaves of bread in John chapter 6 when Jesus was able to feed all those people with the five loaves and the two fish. God's love is like that. You can eat all you can eat. You can eat more than you think you can eat, and there's still so much left over. What does the love of God look like? If it looks anything like that bread, God's love looks like this lavish squandering of love that he just gives it, and he gives it, and he gives it. And in the end, we collect infinitely more than there was at the beginning, even af long after that nourishing bread had been consumed. I mean, have you ever considered that, the way they collect all these 12 baskets full of scraps when you started off with enough bread that wouldn't have filled those baskets? But the love of God is like that. It just continues to grow and to grow, and the more we share it, the more it expands. So if you're at a place in your life where you are feeling lost or lonely or you just feel like you need to be loved, you can continue to receive from God as much love as you possibly want. Open yourself up to the love of God because it doesn't run out. You don't reach the bottom of the container. And when you see someone else in your life needing to be loved, you don't have to be stingy with that. You can continue sharing God's love because sharing more of God's love just creates more love. It doesn't diminish the supply. It doesn't decrease. It doesn't go away. God's love is like those multiplying loaves of bread. You could also say that God's love is like the seed that dies and rises again. Scripture often uses that imagery. Paul talks about it in, in terms of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, that he says we're like a seed, that you, know, you plant our body in the ground, but one day there's the resurrection, and what was a seed that wasn't that impressive becomes this beautiful blooming flower that's you know, somehow connected to the seed, but even better than the seed that was planted. So we save lives by giving of our own. That's exactly what Jesus did, isn't it? The way that he saved lives was by giving his life. He continued giving and loving and loving to the point of death. And in his death, God raised up new life for him, but also for us. Small seed that was planted, but look at what a harvest comes from that seed planted in love. So it may not be the case that we, each of us is 
literally crucified, but by choosing to die again and again, by dying and giving ourselves in love, this is how God resurrects a church from our actions. So I have to sometimes die to my agenda. There's all the things I wanted to do, but you know, my version of what I thought today was going to be like, sometimes that has to die so that God has a place to work. So we, we plant our good deeds, and then God brings something forth from that. I have to die to my agenda so I have time to pray. Maybe I have to die to my ambition, all the things I wanted to achieve, the titles that I wanted to have for myself, the ways that I wanted to be thought of. I have to let that vision of myself die so that I do have space in my life to serve. Maybe we have to die to our need to be seen a certain way so that we can freely associate with people who are different than us. The world might even call less than us. But again, we try to, we give of ourselves. In the passage that we had read by Kerry earlier, Paul talks about his own life as a drink offering. He's writing to the Philippians and he says, I know you guys are making sacrifices in your life. So just the way that you're giving of your life for Christ, I'm going to give of my life right beside you. So the drink offering was kind of a supplemental offering. So as you give, I'm also giving. It was a way of, of pouring out his life. And so we die to ourselves so that our sacrifices together complement each other. God's love is like that seed that we plant, the seed that dies, that blooms into something much better. As you think about going about your life serving God, being God's vessels, I hope this will make sense, but I want to encourage you, do not devalue what I would call secondary causes. You know, God is the ultimate cause. This is ultimately God's work we're doing. The mission that we have, it's not our mission, it's God's mission that we're connecting our lives to. God is the, the unmoved mover. He is the cause behind all other causes. But because of that, sometimes we're tempted to look at our own lives and service and say, well, you know, what I'm doing doesn't matter all that much. Something that's concerning to me is that often when a person's making a decision to do something generous connected to church, whether that's something that you're giving or it's time that you're volunteering or it's energy you're going to spend on some weekend helping with something, sometimes the way that we convince ourselves to do more is to try and convince ourselves that what we're doing is insignificant. Well, you know, I think I'm going to go ahead and give up the weekend and serve for this thing going on at church. Yeah, and man, it seems like a lot, but you know what? Weekend's not all that much. I just need to get over myself. I, I don't think God ever calls us to devalue what we do for him. Jesus is the one who says that even if you give someone a cup of cold water, if you're doing it for him, he's going to remember that and celebrate that in your honor. I love that because any restaurant you go to, you know why I order water? I mean, I pretend it's a health benefit. I'm cheap. I don't want to pay for anything. Water's free, right? But God says, even a cup of cold water, even if you give something small, if you're doing it because of me, it's not small in my eyes. When God is calling on you to be his ambassadors, don't devalue the role that you have in being a source of encouragement and a source of light to people around you, because it is through you that God is going to reach people. You may not be the primary cause, you may be the secondary cause, but just the same, your acts of service, your acts of generosity are valuable to God. Likewise, as messengers of God, we cannot devalue the role that we play. There's a metaphor that people will use when they think about trying to be exceptional. Uh, in fact, in China, they've got this, this saying. They'll say, don't be the tallest blade of grass because the tallest blade of grass is the one that gets cut. But that's kind of what, different than what we normally say in America. In the United States, we like to talk about, you know, going against the grain and swimming upstream and doing everything the hard way. I mean, we like those metaphors, but in terms of how we actually function, when it comes to being, a, being an exceptional person because of your Christian faith, we are tempted to follow something much more like that, where I don't like being called a, a goody two-shoes. Or I don't like being, we might say, a stick in the mud. You know, when you're the tallest blade of grass, it's just a way to get yourself cut down. I think Paul would tell us we're using the wrong metaphors. He gives us a much better one in Philippians 2. Paul says, as you go about, as this imperfect vessel, this jar of clay, as you go about holding the word of life, he says, you need to shine like a star in the sky. He says, you're not being a stick in the mud, you're being a star in the sky. 
Stars are beautiful, and they're even more beautiful because they stand out against the darkness. He says, your light needs to shine so that people can see it, so that they can see that there's a better way. Light has a way of clarifying things and revealing things. For a person who loves darkness and is clinging to darkness, light can be very threatening, can't it? So it's only natural that people would want to devalue us or insult us, but the truth is people need light in their life. They need the light of your love or God's love shining through you. They need the light of clarity that comes from having convictions, things that you believe sincerely and things that you act on based on those convictions. Paul wants us to use that metaphor for ourselves. Don't say, I'm just being a goody two-shoes or I'm being a stick in the mud. You tell yourself, I'm being a star in the sky who needs to shine so that others can also find the way. As we go about trying to figure out how we can be faithful vessels of God, there's a lot of passages we can look at that talk about the diversity of gifts that we have. And I am convinced that each of us has unique and special ways in which we serve and certainly in which we reflect the image of God. But just in general... A good question you could be asking as you're trying to sort out your life is, what could I do right now that would illuminate and inspire? If I'm supposed to shine like a star, I want to be giving light. I want to be giving inspiration. So we don't want to be people who merely just go with the flow or do the least or don't try to draw attention to things that matter or things that are good. But instead, we are trying to be people that are exceptional. So the question to ask in every circumstance is, what could I be doing right now that would show the love of Christ in an exceptional way, in such a way that it even sheds light on their life and their situation? How can I be so consistent in showing love that people can't help but notice it? What can I be doing that would illuminate and inspire the way that God has changed me and has given me something better to live into? Because it is conspicuous. And when people see the difference and they experience the love, suddenly the message becomes something that is appealing and is valuable. As you think about your own life this morning, we've probably all got ways that we need to be more courageous, that we need to be more bold, more unashamed of the gospel, more willing to try and, and let our light shine as brightly as we can. I'm sure each of us has ways we need to work on that. Maybe this morning, though, there's something that's just heavy on your heart, there's something that you're thinking about, something that you're struggling with that we could be praying for, or maybe you have been seeing the light in another person's life, and you are wanting to commit yourself to Christ or, or recommit yourself to Christ. Uh, whatever it is that you're needing to do this morning, we'd be glad to visit with you. We'll give you an opportunity to come forward if you'd like. While together we stand and sing this song.